welcome to This Is Your Life. Well, as you see, quite a few people waiting, just a few paces from where I'm standing now, for the man I'm on the trail of. But only last weekend, something like 20 million people were watching him. But right now, he and his colleagues are making a personal appearance here at a co-op supermarket in South London. And any second now, they'll be lining up for press photographs, which is my signal to go out. Well, it's not surprising there are many people here, because the man I'm on the trail of is in the news. Only tonight, I've got some unexpected news for him. Hold it, please, for just one second. <laughs> Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen. <laughs> I just want to say, hold it, hold it, and listen, will you, please? Listen. Quiet. Shh. Can we have some quiet, please? Just one thing I want to say very quickly. Gordon Banks, Stoke in England, the world's greatest goalkeeper. Tonight, this is your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a car waiting, we've all the rest for the boys, and if, if you get home in time, we're on the way to the studio, you'll see Gordon Banks, This Is Your Life, so why not join us? You ready? Come on. <laughs> Well now, Gordon, what did you think was happening back at the store when I came on? <laughs> well, first of all, I, mean, I thought I was um, having the photograph taken, and, um, and then, of course, when you turned to me, I didn't know whether to dive to the left or the right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gordon Banks, OB, this is your life, a life that's taken you, the son of a Sheffield steelworker, to world fame as a soccer star, hero of two World Cups with saves like this in Mexico 1970 that have you known everywhere as the world's greatest goalkeeper. And as your Stoke City teammates here know, we only have to go back five days to prove that yet again. Because last Saturday at Wembley Stadium, it was your brilliance that helped your club win their first ever trophy in 108 years, the Football League Cup. Trying to nod it for Garland. Garland getting the shot in, a beautiful piece of goalkeeping by Banks. And Cook now with the corner. Oscar at the far side, getting a hit to it, and a wonderful save again by Banks. Getting behind it and holding it. And there's Garland now, going in, and Banks saving it. Tremendous challenge by Banks, a dreadful back pass by Bernard. And Garland stretched out. Wonderful skills there by Banks. To the right, and now two coming up from Osgood. This is his best one, I think, he, he got hold of that mark. And after that, plenty to sing about, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, singing as loud as anyone, there was the man who scored the winning goal and shared this headline with you, the golden oldies. Eastham tops them, Banks stops them. George, you know Gordon better than most, don't you? I'll say I do, yes. We've been rooming together for so long. I don't think either of us care to remember just how long it's been. Uh, the only consolation is that I've, I've seen his passport. And everybody thinks I'm the oldest member of the team, but we'll, we'll keep that a secret. <laughs> Thank you, George. Actually, George used to be six foot two, but we've played so many replays that, that uh, you know... <laughs> <laughs> well, now, there, there was someone we didn't see there in the bath, but who's played a bigger part as anybody, George, yourself, the boys in that victory. The man who signed on, Gordon Banks, five years ago and masterminded that cup win. The happiest manager in football, Tony Warrington.
fine story about that and congratulations. <coughs> now, you've always said that when you signed Gordon for £50,000, you got the bargain of the century, right? Oh, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Not even Gordon. <laughs> uh, at that particular time, it was incredible, really. Here's the, the world's greatest goalkeeper, uh, available for £50,000. I mean, what's happened just recently, uh, my God, you've got to think back to those days and you wonder. Uh, what's happening to football at the moment? Transfer fees at the moment are spiralling so high. And uh, here's the greatest bargain of all time, £50,000. I just didn't believe it. And in fact, it was the easiest deal we have ever done, which is typical of Gordon. I, I, I phoned his manager on the Friday, I rang Gordon on the Saturday, agreed to see him on the Sunday, signed him on the Monday, and it was as simple as that. And what I could not believe, really, at the time, here's... Uh, actually, he was playing for England on the Saturday against Scotland uh, when I was doing this deal. And at £50,000, no, nobody wanted to know. Incredible. But obviously this was to our advantage anyway. And you're pretty confident he's going to keep up the good work for some time, aren't you? Oh, another 10, 15 years. <laughs> I don't believe George Easton, by the way. <laughs> he goes over to South Africa just to get a rebor and a uh, blood transfusion <laughs> and, uh, and comes back, he comes back feeling younger and looking it, by the way. On Monday, didn't you uh, have news for him about a new contract? Well, this new contract is, uh, I must admit, something of a mystery to both of us because he signed it about four months ago and we kept it in the dark and we thought it would be good for this programme, even. So you think he'll still be playing when he's as old as George Eastham, then? I'm sure be <laughs> they'll both be playing for a long, long time yet. <laughs> Thank you, Tony Waddington. Thank you. <laughs> Gordon, as we've just seen earlier tonight, you get the kind of acclaim from your fans that usually goes with pop stars. When I first met him, I thought he was a pop star. Yes, the girl you first met nearly 16 years ago when you were in the army in Germany, your wife Ursula. On the way here to the studio, he wanted to know where you're here, but of course I wouldn't answer him. Anyway, Ursula, when you met him, he was an army driver. You didn't even know, did you, he was a footballer? Oh, no, no. Uh, he used to have crowds of soldiers around him, uh, this little pop dance we used to go to. And he used to pretend to play a guitar, and he used to mouth the words so perfect, you know, I thought, he can play a bit, and, and he couldn't play a note, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was the idea of having a guitar, Gordon, if he couldn't play it? I don't know, it's just, uh, just enjoying to the evening. I, I just enjoyed myself when I went out, you know, and just hoping that, you know, that um, pop music was the thing I liked so much and, uh, you know, I just seemed to... You do your Elvis Presley bit, <laughs> huh? <laughs> I'd love to know how that goes. <laughs> Anyhow, that was in 1956 in Germany. A year later, Ursula returned with you to England and you were married in Sheffield, your hometown. For it was there that you were born, in that bedroom over there, in the house at 15... Arthur Road, on December the 30th, 1937. You were the youngest son of a farmer turned foundry worker, your father, the late Tommy Banks. And you were brought up in this house in Ferrers Road, Tinsley. At just a few yards from that door was your first Wembley. That pitch there you call the wreck. It was there, Gordon, you played your first game of football and where today youngsters dream of becoming another Gordon Banks. But you weren't, Gordon, always uh, in the role of a goalkeeper, were you? No, I'm and um, at school I used to play all different kinds. Well, I think it was a, a matter of getting a game wherever I could. Any position really would do. I think um, I, I started at centre half of the school, uh -huh. but eventually uh, I moved back in goal because well, sometimes you find that nobody wants to ever play in goal and the game can never start. So I said, well, "All right, then I'll go in for one, and then uh, we'll take it in turns." Well, somebody said to me that one day you played centre forward in a smash hit, and the man who said that was your brother David, who's come down from Sheffield with your brother Mike and your mother Helen. <laughs> David, you tell me what you meant when you told me earlier that Gordon was a smash hit. Well, I remember once when he had the ball, he took it down the field towards the goals and he gave it a good crack. It went over the bar, across the road and through somebody's window. <laughs> did he make a run for it? No, the rest of the team did. <laughs> but he went to the front door, knocked on the door and asked for his ball back. <laughs> did he get it back? Yeah. He must have had a nerve even then, Gordon. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> now, he wasn't only a smash hit Mrs. Banks on the football field, he also starred in the Tinsley Council School on stage, didn't he? <coughs> yes. And he, re he, re he rehearsed vastly, he couldn't stop rehearsing, and uh, he was the star hit of the This was a big Council. dramatic role, was it? Oh, yes. It was Goldilocks and the Three Bears. <laughs> <laughs> he was Father Bear, because he had such big hands and feet. <laughs> now, what, what was it he had to rehearse? Uh, don't go down in the woods today, you sure of a big surprise. <laughs> well, now, Gordon, if you look at that screen over there, you're in for a big surprise. Your own children, 13-year-old Robert, 9-year-old Wendy, and the baby of the family, 3-year-old little Julia. And beautiful she is, all of them. Hello, Daddy. Hi, you got little Daddy? Hello, hello. <laughs> hello, Daddy. Hello. I bet you're surprised to see... I bet you're surprised to be here today. Hey, I'll be running round with the cup on Saturday because all the lads aren't going to come and see you if you don't. Enjoy yourself because we'll look after Julia. She's a very good girl as well. Say bye-bye then. Bye! Bye-bye, Daddy. Bye. Get off! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robert, Wendy, and Julia. <laughs> well, now, when you were about Robert's age, he's only 13, when you were 14, you were chosen to represent Sheffield schoolboys, but after hardly half a dozen games, you were dropped from the side. Now, it was a terrible blow for a boy with ambitions to become a professional, and you wrote off that ambition as just a schoolboy dream, and left school and became an apprentice at a local builder's. Never mind goalkeeper, he could have made the world's greatest bricklayer. <laughs> Your foreman for two years, come in, Tom Boyd. <laughs> Tom, was he really that good as a bricklayer? He was all as good with his hands. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever task I put him to, he, he was all as the best. Well, there you are. Compliments all round. Thank you, Tom Boyd. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, for more than a year, Gordon Banks, the apprentice bricklayer, was lost to football. The former schoolboy star couldn't even find a team to play with. Until one Saturday afternoon, when he returned home from work, he was just sitting there when someone knocks on the door. We're short of a goalie. Can you help us out, Gordon? Now, those words brought you back to football, and the man who spoke them 19 years ago is someone you haven't seen since those days, but he's here tonight, your teammate that afternoon, Stan Baxter. Was, uh, what was this team that was short of a goalie? Millsball Limited. It was our works team. Well, there are four of the men who played alongside you that day. They're right here tonight. Bert Glaves, Harold Elliott, Bernard Foy and Albert Williams. <laughs> now, Stan, tell me, what made you knock on Gordon's door? Well, Millsball's had a fixture that day, home fixture, and... Uh, well, Gordon, being the best goalkeeper in Tinsley at the time, he played for Sheffield Boys. Well, there were a few minutes for kick-off, and they said, we want a goalie, so it was race off in tugs, and we both raced back in tugs, <laughs> and we got there a few minutes before kick-off. <laughs> <laughs> I think he did. <laughs> With me football socks and bubble. Uh, yes. Albert, how did he react to his recall to duty? Played a liner. He did, and I know that he played for quite some time for you. How, you know, went on, how did he do as it went on? Well, he played a lot of good games until one day we had a visit from a first division scout. What <laughs> happened, I mean? Boy. <laughs> well, he had a chat with you at half time, Gordon. Oh, that's right, yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. But the second half, he let four goals in. Because <laughs> <laughs> he got all upset knowing the scout was there. He was very upset. Well, tell me, letting four goals in, Harold, how did the lads react? Well, putting it rather mildly, I, I recall saying that uh, goalkeepers couldn't stop a bloody clock. <laughs> Thank you, Stan, Bert, Harold, Edward and Albert. <laughs> well, that was 1953 and those four goals didn't deter neighbouring third division club Chesterfield. And the man who helped introduce your name to league football 19 years ago uh, now Chesterfield's general manager is here tonight, Arthur Sutherland. <laughs> uh, 
Arthur, I know that everyone connected with Chesterfield Football Club is, you know, proud that they gave Gordon Banks his first big chance at football. You're particularly proud, aren't you? Exactly so, yes. Uh, I had the pleasure, Mr. Davison was then the manager of the club, and I had the delightful pleasure of helping to sign Gordon on uh, as a, in his first professional engagement. We always follow Gordon very interestedly. We're delighted to see his success. I know at that time we weren't... Uh, we couldn't fore foresee what the future was going to bring to him, but nevertheless, we we're delighted that he's had so much success in the game, and we wish him exceedingly well for the future. You did have one problem with him, didn't you? Oh, yes. Uh, Gordon always used to be in trouble with the trainers because he would never get out of the goals. Uh, they always used to be telling him off simply because he was frequently diving about when they wanted to go for lunch and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank like you him. very much, yeah. Arthur Sutherland. Yeah. Now, it was at Chesterfield that you got your first taste of cup football as a member of the club youth team and in 1956 reached the final of the FA Youth Club. Your team was beaten by the youths of Manchester United and one of the goals headed past you came from another youngster who, like you, went on to make quite a name for himself and now is going to talk to you from a studio in Manchester, your England teammate for almost ten years, himself a soccer great, your friend Bobby Charlton. Hello, Gordon. I'm uh, very honoured indeed that I'm able to say just a little word uh, about you this evening. What I, what I think of you as a professional player and a professional goalkeeper, uh, I would need more than the allotted time that I have tonight. I am very grateful that I've, been, that I've had the opportunity over the many years that we've known each other to be able to play against you and to wonder at your skill and to wonder at your dedication. I think it's tremendous that a person who is a goalkeeper has lots of things that he has to do, that he has to work on, that I probably as a forward don't understand. But I know that you, being as dedicated as you are and giving everything to your club, who the, fort the fortunate club at the present time is Stoke City, I I'm delighted that they've succeeded in winning something at last. I'm delighted that you've been part of them. And I hope that tonight your wife, uh, your family and your friends have a wonderful evening because I'm sure that they deserve it all, and you deserve it, deserve it all for everything that you've done for British football. Thank you, Bobby Charlton. Well said. Well, that was a tribute, obviously, from the heart, eh? <laughs> Great lad, Bob. He is. Now, that initial rivalry with Bobby continued when, on May 7, 1959, you were transferred to First Division Club Leicester City for the modest sum of £8,000. And, Mike, you gave your brother Gordon some advice on that occasion, didn't you? Yes. Can you remember, Gordon, just after you got there, when uh, the next time I saw you, I, you, I said, uh, are you going on there? And you said, oh, I don't like it here very much. I said, why not? He said, well, they've already got seven goalkeepers. <laughs> so I said, well, you just have to roll your sleeves up and show them your stuff. Yes, um, show them that he did. stuff he did, because in the next four years, you helped Leicester to two FA Cup Wembley finals against Spurs in 1961 and Bobby's team, Manchester United, in 1963. Although Leicester didn't win the Cup, 1963 was a year that you will always remember, the year of your first international cap. It was against Scotland and the first of your 69 caps. But in all those record-breaking number of games, one stands out high above the rest. The day that England won the World Cup against Germany. Now, I know, Ursula, that you were there at that game. And coming from West Germany yourself, you must have had uh, mixed feelings. I well, didn't have any, really. I got the biggest England rosette. And uh, I remember after the match, we, uh, it was one of those rare occasions when the wife manages to get into the Wembley Tunnel. Mrs. Moore led us, I think. And... Uh, I managed to find Gordon and we just sort of hugged each other and cried, you know, it's fantastic. We just, we just had a marvellous time and, and it was just England for me all the way. And Gordon, I'm sure that you'll never forget those scenes at Wembley on that day, the day England won the World Cup for the first time in the history of football, July 30th, 1966. Can you recall today, Gordon, what your feelings were at that moment? You've had lots of things like the weekend, this weekend, but just back to that particular day. 
Um, well, they were marvellous, really, because, um, you know, th this is really the, the, the highest honour you can ever achieve, really, when once you've beaten everybody in the world, then, of course, this is, um, this is absolutely marvellous. But um, even so, um, on Saturday, I, I still got exactly the same sort of thrill running around with the lads, and uh, uh, the, the, these are the things that you work for in the game, and um, you, you finally achieve, you know, if you're lucky enough. Exactly. And I know that on that day in 1966, there are two people who will never forget that particular game as long as they live. And they're both here tonight. Two more of your pals. England captain Bobby Moore. <laughs> and the man who scored three of those four goal-winning goals, match-winning goals, Jeff Hurst. Now, Bobby, you've been in some tough corners with Gordon. What is it, and you're the man who should know, that makes him uh, deserve this description, the, the world's greatest goalkeeper? I think it's a very simple thing, really. Um, I mean, he just saves more goals than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think, honestly, that, uh, you know, apart from all his wonderful skill and ability, it's uh, um, the assurance the way he goes about the job. I think, uh, you know, as assured in life as a whole, it's very easy to go on with, very easy going. And I think when he gets on the field, you know, this confidence, um, you know, spreads throughout the whole team. And it's so nice to know that when you're playing in front of Gordon that you've got someone there who's so assured and so confident about what he's got to do and uh, who can do the job better. Well, obviously. And Jeff, Gordon, you, you had uh, respect for this fellow a long time before that cup win, huh? Yeah. Uh, my first England call up about six years ago. We shoot him before the actual game itself and it took me about five minutes to realise this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in between the sticks. And my colleagues at West Ham got a bit fed up me saying it. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a, a sharp reminder of that just recently, didn't you? Yeah, well, I must be some kind of mug because every time I turn up <laughs> for a tribute to Gordon, they're showing this blasted film of him saving my penalty about two months ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and apart from that, you might have been in there on, on Saturday, of course, I know that. But um, because it's your night, Gordon, he's, he's given his permission to show that blasted shot again. <laughs> so take another look at that sensational save that put Stoke City on the road to Wembley. And now it's Hurst against Banks. And Banks has saved it miraculously. And the crowd are stunned and Stoke are delighted. Banks has pulled off some fantastic saves in his time. But surely nothing to equal that one from Jeff Hurst. Gordon Banks at his brilliant best. Thank you, Jeff Hurst, and thank you, of course, Bobby Moore. I think we'll have to promise, Jeff, we'll never show that again. <laughs> How did you do it? Um, well, actually, it's, it's, it was one of those things where, you, you know, you s Jeff, it uh, doesn't take a small run up to the ball, you know, and... Um, he sort of gallivanted in there, and there was fire coming down his nostrils, and you know, and uh, and I, I, I thought as it was about to hit the ball, that my first reaction was, well, I've got to dive out the way of this. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, it, it hit my arm and uh, went over the bar. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, even talking about the World Cup as I did to you a few moments ago, into your mind came last Saturday, which is uppermost in your mind and all the minds of the boys here. And one final thing is missing tonight as we pay tribute to you, Gordon Banks, and of course, and through you, to Stoke City. That first trophy in more than a hundred years, the Football League Cup. But we haven't forgotten it, and three important people in your life have made sure of that. Robert, Wendy, and Julia. <laughs> earlier pretending they were at home yeah <laughs> <laughs> Gordon Banks OBE this is your life thank you very much <laughs>